Elsewhere in the bomber stream, other B-17s were under heavy attack. As they turned into us, and of course they were head-on attacks, and you could see them blinking, the blinking of those 30 millimeters coming at you. But they were so rapid that uh, if you were hit, it, at one moment you were flying without any damage, and the next moment you were in trouble. The flak over Berlin was the kind they said was so thick you could walk on it. That's about the time we picked up our third hit. It put a terrific hole in, in the top turn gunner, and he died right there on the spot. So we were flying with engine and rudder, is all we had left. And it's a kind of a dying swan sort of a thing. Uh, there's no way you're going to recover. You're going down, you know it, but you're giving the people a chance to get out. The uh, other waste gunner was thrown against the tailwheel strut, and I was thrown against him. The plane went into a dive, and uh, I can remember him screaming in my ear, and, and I could feel his head just crushing underneath, my, you know, my weight and that plane in that dive. I started to jump. I looked back and saw the radio operator laying on the floor of the radio room with his right leg all bloody. And his eyes were about the size of saucers and black as coal. And I went back and got his chute and got it on him and got him to the waste door. There's nothing going past that door but just fire. And he kind of locked up on the door. And I had to jerk him loose from that and throw him out the door so I could get out. So when I drop through that Bombay opening, you just can't believe the quietness out, and yet you see all this activity going. Airplanes and uh, bomb bursts, and uh, you see planes going down, and I could see my plane slowly spiraling towards the ground with this long stream of flame coming out of it. And of course, you, you hope and pray that every one of your members got out. This day, the theory of daylight strategic bombing was vindicated. Berlin was successfully attacked. The losses of the 8th Air Force had been acceptable. They were less than 10%. It occurred to a number of us that day that it must be very demoralizing to Germany to, to see that kind of force over Berlin itself. I remember turning off the target at Berlin, looking back, this armada that seemed to stretch right over the horizon. I don't think anyone will ever see anything like that again. Does your mouth or know your eyes, Cecilia? Does she know that I'm about to steal you? My own One of the first things that we'd do after we was out of uh, danger, that uh, someone would pop up and say, hey, Mick, sing a song, or hey, Bob, sing a song, or how about tracking a joke here or that. It kept us alive, you know, it, uh, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Everybody enjoyed it. I, oh, when I look in your eyes, something tells me that you and I should get together. Bob Shones began to worry about the rest of his bomber group. When you're flying home, and the combat's over, then the things start to occur to you that uh, there's a lot of airplanes missing someplace, you wonder where they are. And hope, you hope that they just got scattered and they'll turn up. But uh, when you get close to home, you know, and you're all alone going to your base, you know that there's something wrong because there's nobody else around you on your way. And when you come into the field and circle around the to land, you can see a lot of empty parking spaces. We 
landed and taxied to our assigned parking place and were immediately met by our squadron commander who wanted to know what had happened. How do you tell them what's happened? How do you know what's happened other than there are no other aircraft around and the crews didn't come back? He started to cry. And when he started to cry, I guess we all started to cry. It was a shocking moment to realize that you, you alone, had come back. And all the others had not. The March 6th raid on Berlin had cost 69 heavy bombers and 11 fighters. 701 young men. It was the worst total of any raid in the war. Yet the figures represented only a 6% loss. That was acceptable, so far as the theory went. My dear family, I'm tired tonight. I put in a very heavy day, spending over 10 hours in my home in the sky. I was just thinking, I could almost fly home from here in that amount of time. But things are looking better over here, so don't worry about me. All my love, Harold. The Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that your son, First Lieutenant Harold F. Henslin, has been reported killed in action April 28th over France. Lieutenant Henslin would now be 62. It was his 21st mission. Three of his crew survived. Twenty-six thousand men of the 8th Air Force died on active service, all of them far too young. Seventeen men won the Medal of Honor, seven thousand the Purple Heart, but they won much more than that. They won generations of peace in Europe. Children not yet born will be their debtors. They themselves, of course, had different reasons for doing what they did. Flying an airplane was, to us 20-year-olds, a, let's face it, kind of a romantic thing to do. It was new and different. It was glamour. I had to fly. It just never entered our minds that um, we wouldn't fly. We were trained to do it. We believed in the mission that we were on, that uh, Hitler had to be stopped. I couldn't refuse to fly. I, I couldn't do it. I mean, you know, they were like brothers to me. My crew, didn't any of them not go? I mean, I'm gonna do what they do, you know? I was scared. Everybody was scared. We were doing our job. We were being part of our, the times in which we lived. We were assigned to a particular moment in that time and we were trying to fulfill it. I don't think that I can cast it more heroically as much as I'd like to.
NBC News produced this program and is responsible for its content.